a pleasant day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host for this very significant, and I would like to begin by saying it's a beautiful event already in my mind when I read the script. This is what we call, it's simply entitled, A Given Grace, Interreligious. And we have so many poets who will be coming together in this one special moment. And I would like to acknowledge the presence of poets Shilpa Dixit uh, Tapliel. Okay, hi. Just for the camera, pose and smile. Not yet. Okay, and I'm just introducing all of you yet according to my script. And we have Rabaya Miriam. Hi. And we'll be giving all the details about your names. Kendra Tang, Kimberly Williams, Shelley Bryant, Noor Iskandar, Aoyang Waikit. And of course, we'd like to uh, allow me a few minutes to do an introduction. It is a stupendous to see everyone here to celebrate poetry as a means to reflect on and to celebrate communion with the divine. I am Pamela Wildheart, and I am also a poet like you, songwriter, and a celebrity host in Singapore. In what ways can poetry illuminate overlapping circles of concern between religions? What are the insights that emerge when language gestures towards the ineffable and the numinous? In this interfaith poetry reading organized by the Poetry Festival of Singapore, we are going to join our poets and readers from a variety of religious backgrounds. And the names are listed here again. We have Catholics, Protestant, and if you are, we have Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, and Buddhist traditions, as they all share poems about faith and spirituality, including from the anthology A Given Grace, co-edited by Desmond Khan Zicheng Mingde and Eric Tinsei Valier. Thank you, and I'm going to begin, and I do have a lengthy but important script. Page three. We are honored to feature the following writers and poets, and let us now begin with Miss Shilpa Dixit Tapliao. She was a former computer professional who has turned bilingual poet from Singapore. She, has a, she was a Pushcart Prize nominee, an author of Between Sips of Masala Chai, Kitab International in 2019, and Chimes of the Soul, self-published in 2015. The poems have been featured in the Best Asian Poetry 2021, Trivium, Kyoto Writers Residency, Quarterly Literary, Literary Review, Singapore, Volume 19, 20 and the Yearbook of English Indian Poetry 2022-2021, the Tiger Moth Review, Hex 7, among other publications. Now, she has read poetry in Malaysia, USA, Mumbai, or Mumbai, and Australia. Shilpa volunteers with the Poetry Festival of Singapore as a writer and a literary organizer. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now give a warm welcome by giving her your applause to Miss Shilpa, who is here with us, Dikshit Tapliao. Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Pam, for such a kind introduction. Um, it's my honor. Thank you, Poetry Festival Singapore, for featuring me in this special reading. Um, the two poems which I'm going to be reading are um, on my Hindu faith. And the first poem is based on a Sanskrit prayer which uh, appears in the Upanishads, mainly from the Brihadranayak Upanishad, which deals with the purification of the Atma or the soul. And uh, it's a favorite prayer of mine. And the poem is titled Shraddha. Uh, the prayer goes like this. Asato ma sadgamaya, tamso ma jyotirgamaya, mrityor ma amritam gamaya, om shanti, 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 which translates as, from untruth lead me to truth, from darkness lead me to light, from death 
lead me to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. So the poem which is um, based on this is titled Shraddha, which translates as faith. Concentric circles of jasmine, marigolds and tulsi decorate the ornate silver thali. The ghee lamp lights up the altar. Under the warm glow, labyrinths of to-dos erode. Tidal swell of doership ebbs with chants of mantras and shlokas. The foundering mind contemplates, bows for absolution to walk the path where, luminescent by his love, wild flowers embroider divine colors and oblivious of observers bloom in existential peace, where, anchored to the earth, flourishing above the ground, each iridescent petal, leaf and bud is a hymn of and to the heavens, where Himalayas and Alps, Pyrenees and the Balkans hold quietude in their fold, and between equinoxes and solstices, Rotations and revolutions, days flow seamlessly, where the migratory Siberian cranes nestling on Yamuna and Ganga are bearers of love, peace and faith, a segue for transcendence. Linger, meander or wanderer, step into this cadence, harvest nature's salve, Embody this yogic union of stillness at the core. Palms folded in a pranam, I invoke Shraddha and Saburi. Thank you. This is my first poem. Thank you. The second poem appears in my book, Between Sips of Masala Chai, and uh, it's titled Varanasi. Varanasi is the oldest living Hindu city in the world. And uh, it's my good fortune that I was born there. And I was uh, raised there my early childhood years. So I have very fond memories. So this poem is titled Varanasi. Under tilted umbrellas, chants reverberate. Agni licks the muslin. Surya bows. Shiva sets free. Together, they celebrate the mortal remains. Parts of me still reside on banks of Banaras. Initiation had started centuries ago. Yet with every birth, the seeker seeks her name. Between banks of Varuna and Assi, through gullies and looms, the city weaves silver with gold, warps of life, wefts of afterlife. My years in Varanasi are rubber stamped by the resounding conch in the dome. Beetle staled corners, bare chested rickshaw peddlers, the glass bangles, brocade motives have trespassed into my adulthood. Meanwhile, the wheel of dharma turns. Every hymn along the Ganga blesses the departed soul. Moksha is gained on the cart steps of Manikarnika. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shilpa Taplial. And she was sharing with us those very beautiful poems. Significantly, a lot of culture there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the next reader and the next poet is Rabaya Miriam Weinberg. She serves as a rabbi at the UHS, or the United Hebrew Congregation in Singapore, and the Singapore's progressive Jewish community. She's a native of New York, and Rabia Miriam is proud to be the first woman rabbi in Singapore. For that, we should give her a big round of applause, isn't it? And as a rabbi, 
Educator and ritual creator Rabbi Miriam values interfaith relationships, connecting people across the lines of faith. Rabbi Miriam loves exploring Jewish foodways, reading Israeli poetry, and examining the Jewish sacred texts through a contemporary feminist lens. Let us welcome her on stage. Thank you for that introduction, Pam. It's so wonderful to be here this afternoon. I'm not reading my own words today. I am reading the words of my tradition from a few poets who wrote in English, in Hebrew, and in Yiddish originally from the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. This first poem is by Marge Piercy. We are the people of the word, and the breath of the word fills our minds with light. We are the people of the word, and the breath of life sings through us, playing on the pipes of our bones and the strings of our sinews, an ancient song carved in the Laurentian granite, and new as a spring Asia butterfly just drying her wings in a moment's splash of sun. We must live the word and make it real. We are the people of the book, and the letters march busy as ants, carrying the work of the ages through our minds. We are the people of the book. Through fire and mud and dust, we have borne our scrolls tenderly as a baby swaddled in a blanket, traveling with our words sewn in our clothes and carried on our backs. Let us take up the scroll of Torah, and dance with it, and touch it, and read it out. For the mind touches the word and makes it light. So does light enter us, and we shine. This next poem is by an Israeli poet, Rivka Miriam. I spread out God's names in front of me on the floor of my chilly room. The name by which I called him when his spirit breathed in me and the name by which I called him when I was a young girl. The name by which I called him when I was given to a man and the name when I was again permitted to all. The name by which I called him when my parents were a roof to me and the name when I had no ceiling the name by which I called him so that I would fear him, and the name by which I called him so that I would not be afraid, the name by which I called him so that he would remember me, and the name so that he would refrain from remembering. In the heat of the day, I prostrate myself on the floor of my chilly room. This next poem is one of my absolute favorite pieces of poetry by the Yiddish poet Aaron Zeitlin. Praise me, says God, and I will know that you love me. Curse me, says God, and I will know that you love me. Praise me or curse me, and I will know that you love me. Sing out my graces, says God. Raise your fist against me and revile, says God. Sing out graces or revile. Reviling is also a kind of praise, says God. But if you sit fenced off in your apathy, says God, if you sit entrenched in, I don't care at all, says God, if you look at the stars and yawn, if you see suffering and don't cry out, if you don't praise and you don't revile, then I created you in vain says God. And the last words that I'll share today, again from Rivka Miriam. They said redemption would come only when no one's expecting it anymore. And one night, they sat silent and awake at the thresholds of their stores and homes and didn't expect redemption. And when dawn rose, there were tears rolling down from all the rooftops. Thank you. Thank you, Rabia Miriam Feinberg.
for once I listened with such stillness, okay, so meaningful, especially the part about praise and curse to my life. We'd like, now like to call upon Kendra Tan. She's our next poet. She's a, in her final year diploma in the law and management. She's a student at the Tomasic Polytechnic in Singapore. As a budding poet, Kendra enjoys writing pieces inspired by her interactions with others, her thoughts, feelings, and experiences in her daily life. She sees poetry as an empowering means of self-expression in which she can put in words the complexities of life that she has experienced. In her free time, Kendra enjoys learning more about history and heritage and enjoys visiting museums while seeking to continue refining her poetic craft. Welcome. Hello. Um, thank you for giving me this chance. So, um, this is my first time reading a poem and putting my poems in public. So, um, just pardon me if I slip. Um, the first poem, uh, when I wrote this poem, uh, the title is called Innocent Despair Voyage. Um, it was in, the title was inspired by the, uh, the poet Adam Tai, who would, would be able to type out a poem whenever you just tell him three words. Uh, as for the content of the poem, um, this was a response to a friend after having this conversation. It, it moved me to a point that I felt so bad that I couldn't comfort her at that point, so it moved me to write this poem. So the poem is Innocent Despair Voyage. Roses appear, innocent, genuine. People, friendly, helpful. Knife spear, cards flip, divulging, grazing truths. The world emerges spiteful, overflowing suspicion, despair. Still, diamonds dazzle under pressure, claps onto certitude that there are people who care, look out for you. Now, Take hold of the strenuous task. Walk to that tree. Cut, keep, weeds, evergrowth, thorns. Place them in thine basket. Never forget, as ye voyage through this expedition, the one we call life. So the second poem was written um, specially for this uh, talk. Um, I wrote, I was at the National Gallery when I wrote the poem. So the two um, art pieces are Age of Full Bloom and uh, the Red, Red Morning Glory um, of Fireburn. I can't remember the exact name, but it's the art piece right beside it at Gallery 10 of the National Gallery. So in this poem, I'm trying to incorporate the idea of faith and spirituality while using certain images and expressions in the artwork, as well as some of the personal things that I had went through at a point of time to create this poem. So the poem is called Emerging Camellias. Head full of flowers, masking hurt, pressure, work, expectations, hit my shoulders, Triggering pain, fatigue, never knowing what is to come. Still, faith and relentless prayers keep me sturdy as strengths intersect through a network of leaves emerging from tissue tears I shed in plea and desperation, like falling petals from a head, bare and new rejuvenating hope and drive to carry on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kendra. We are awaiting all the poems you'll be doing in the future. There'll be more, I suppose. Kimberly Williams is our next poet. She's an author of two books of poetry, 
Finally, The Moon, published by Stephen Austin, uh, uh, F. Uh, Austin State University Press in 2017, and Sometimes a Woman, published by Reasoned Work Press in 2021. Her third book of poems, Still Lives, is due out in September 2022 from Life Before Man Press in New South Wales, uh, imprint of Gazebo Books. Her poems are also published in anthologies and literary magazines around the world. She's currently completing her PhD from the University of Canberra, where she also serves as the director of the UC's Poetry on the Move Festival. This will have to be on video, ladies and gentlemen. So on the screen, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kimberly K. Williams, and I'm really excited to be reading two of my poems from A Given Grace uh, for this festival. And I am giving out uh, thanks and gratitude for this opportunity to be included as part of it. Um, my first poem is called The Swallows Are Chasing. And the swallows are chasing God, skimming green pools, edging the cliffs, building their nests in the O of his name. The swallows are chasing God, and I am chasing the swallows as far as my flat feet and wingless back will carry me. Around the fat cottonwood, over the gravel, across the bridge to El Rito, past the bare-spotted here sign, almost to the tip of the massive ruby sky. And this is my second poem, also from the anthology, uh, for which I am so grateful to have been included. Um, and this is called Grace. The child works on printing the fat black crayon, marking paper the color of the sun. Uppercase letters align like soldiers G follows G, 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 and then J, 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 J. But the lowercase letters misbehave, reverse, and drift. D, 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 B, D, D, B. P, 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 Q, P, 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 Q, P. She gets the first letter of her name right every time. K, K, K. But the last letter, Y, is tricky. Which way to extend the leg on the V? And she wonders if F is supposed to blow west or east. Each letter forces finger cramps. Her mother patiently insists again, again already teaching the child the great mystery of birth, the great unease which leads to unwavering devotion. Late one night, she accelerates through the dark, rounding the curves of San Juan Boulevard, reminding her of the crayon, tracing loops and filling empty paper. She sees words carved from darkness. All that time at the antique desk, scraping shapes into letters, learning reverence, letters to words, words to love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Kimberly Williams. Despite the fact that it wasn't video, it was real with all the letters. Yes, I can feel the excitement. There is too much of P and Pamela. Thank you. Kidding. Shelley Bryant, poet, writer, and translator, author of 10 volumes of poetry, a pair of travel guides, a book on classical Chinese gardens, and a story, a short story collection. She has translated more than 20 books from the Chinese and edited two poetry anthologies. Her translation of Sheng K. Yi's Northern Girls was long listed for the Man Asian Literary Prize in 2001. 
one, two. Her translation of Eugene's In Time Out of Place was shortlisted for the Singapore Literature Prize in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now with pleasure invite Shelley to share with us her poems. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. I'll be reading today several short poems that were um, included in the anthology A Given Grace. The first one is entitled Prayer and Meditation. Indifference, an admirable goal when polar opposites remain such close cousins, phobia and fetish, sink and swim, left and right. Must no religion always mean that we are left without a prayer? The second poem is entitled Travels Through the Kuiper Belt. Comet in irregular orbit when seen from its star and the inner planets. From beyond, its steps are ordered, pulled by powers too vast, too distant, too subtle for Earth's instruments to take her measure and for her intellects to grasp. This is an untitled sijo. A sijo is a Korean poetry form. Um, and it's often used in religious writings in Korean poetry. And so um, it's a form that I happen to, to like quite a bit and experiment with. My prayers, the very center between the center's mass and mine, moving me to run a pace around the warmth of his glory, moving him, his providence, to answer my pleas. And the next piece is entitled 22nd June, 1633, um, it first appeared in the um, online journal 7 by 20 in October 2015. And if you're not familiar with the date, this is the date that uh, Galileo was forced to recant. Rings shine around Saturn's orb. My telescope's view exploding the walls of his cell. And this piece is entitled Horology. Um, and it first appeared in the online journal Alluvium, which is the literary journal of Literary Shanghai. Sundial, measured moments, the movements of timepieces on high, Earth's flow around her sun. Hourglass, a running stream damned time, pooling at the neck, insisting on its trajectory with each falling grain. Clock. Walking on his hands, we pace ourselves, its cadence prescribing the flow of our days. Timeline. Life's events marked, birth, graduation, marriage, death, life's days passed in the spaces in between. And the final piece is entitled Saturn and His Heir. And uh, it comes with a little quote from um, theplanets.org. It says, Saturn and Jupiter combined account for 92% of the entire planetary mass in the solar system. This poem was written for the 1%. Of the eight, maybe nine gathered here, two hoard the bulk of resources, leaving even less than a tithe from their coffers to be split by the remaining congregants. Like all greedy giants and other felled stars, they float without a face and skinless. Naked, gaseous, and overheated, they swirl in their fancy garb, without a single inch of solid ground on which to stand. While in the hearts of their neighbors, a fire burns, hot and hard, and on those toughened shells, life occasionally burst into being. Thank you so much, Shelley Bryant. So many books, so many translations, and very, very beautiful poems. I'm so glad and honored to be here, really, to host this uh, very meaningful gathering of different cultures and different people. And now I'm so honored again to introduce a multidisciplinary artist and lecturer based in Singapore, Noor Iskandar. His research and practice delve into faith and art, revolving around the faculty of losing and light. He earned his master's in arts research degree from the NTU um, School of Art, Design and Media. His works have been exhibited and published in Singapore, London, Valencia, Pingyao, Belfast, and Bandung. Okay, and he is intrigued by the sacrality of feelings 
the power as well as failings of words and remembrances. He too is obsessed with Iran. The after scent of rain, old books, and double not spicy. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Noor Iskandar. Testing one, two, three. Do, uh, don't mind, I use the mic. I'm a bit like uh, off today. I think it's because of the weather. So I'm just going to read it here. Um, I'm going to read three short confessional poems, actually, um, from my first self-published book called Forgot. So as mentioned, I really enjoy this idea of remembering and forgetting. And um, you will realize soon enough that a lot of my interpretation of divine love is interplayed with romantic love. So enjoy. The first one is called A Poet's Soulmate Assault. There is something sublime about a shy boy walking to the center stage and tracing the craters of his wounds, islands, salt water, volcanoes, subduction, skin, submarine, cotton swabs, continental drift. He was mapping for us the path he traveled and teasing a hurricane at the same time. He, whose metaphors drown in alcohol, we are all sleeping over tonight. If a house could get carried away by a storm, imagine a poet meeting his soulmate. But there is a possibility that the weatherman misinforms. I dropped my shawl in Barcelona when alighting the taxi, the one I bought in Bursa. Segments of blue, earth brown, and concrete gray. I lost the ring bought at the Sunday market in Lisbon, a copper ring with a shield as a core plate on it, an insignia of doves and ferns. I skate sentimentalities across my skin. I carry memories. I wore Iran all over my body. Today, your bloodshot eyes reminded me of the sunsets from the Haju Bridge in Esfahan. You beat peace before entering a home. A poet loses his thoughts the moment he opens his mouth. I don't need you to tell me what home is. I want you to snap the legs of the chair, slit the spine of the mattress, abandon the dining table, flood the buff. I need you to just break it to me gently, the last feeling you felt before sleep. I gained a universe when I, when I was in Seville. My host passed me a book on my second night, Has Siddhartha. He felt like I needed to be a part of it and it felt right for him to part with it. To lose memories, to give away your ring from Esfahan, to unroll the prayer mat, to don the funeral shroud, the gates sheath all the time, there is no point arriving. Thunderstorms can take as quickly as half a day to pick up intensity. There is no telling how quickly you can lose your way. In Mecca, my nanny lost her way once. She liked to see it as a veil from God to unveil his greatest signs, and she gained a universe. You told me that we're all just walking each other home. But I, for one, can't quite gather where home is. Because what if the commonplace for pain becomes a poet's universe? I joined the congregation late for Maghrib, but I hope you saw me walking in. Thank you. The second poem is called To Unholy. I think this is a bit of a not controversial poem, but I think it's something I needed to speak out because I think sometimes people mistake words for something quite prophetic. Um, so here we go, to unholy. Perhaps you need to unholy yourself. Some words reach you like a prayer call in their deep irony. They sit in your belly in rhetoric so divine like strangers asking, so how religious are you? But where do I even begin when all that is left to abstain from is my romanticizing of a private conversation that speaks in metaphors that leads to unadulterated meanings and a curious case of how people are still mistaking a poet for a prophet, a man of unlove as the Ganges, giving, offering, preaching, unbegging, being the sacred womb to all mothers of wisdom, of things your brokenness take pleasure in, like the comfort of a stranger's words, his wounds, tongue, his touch, the sameness of his sadness, poised into the prose and possibilities, postured as a paradox, taken out context like scenes that swim under water but drown over land. In confusion, shameless, without oxygen, spineless, without you who said that, the spine is the most beautiful part of the body, and you wish that we would use more of it. 
But to me, who understands that the burden of truth will misalign the backbone and stars that anchor all forms of wanderings, you cannot walk on this earth without roots. Boots cannot walk without solid ground, but air is solid enough conviction for in intoxicated Sufi, Ahsoka, Akbar, Adam, Hawa, and some truths are best kept in ethics, amnesia, aroma, Andalusia to present-day Spain, and some pain are best forgotten and forgiven, and for yourself only a version of history, a kind of reality like when you told me you had a dream where you fell off a minaret, while I had a dream that you were that minaret. Manara, Manara, madness mistaken, perhaps, We are creatures meant to curate constellations carefully across constants within two walls, two palms crossed. Dua alam, galab, cahaya gerhana. Nirvana is not a position, but a state read of a state, a free verse that begets your universe, that regrets poetic justice and injustice of a potluck, of a draw. A divide is a distraction. Perhaps I don't want to be a temple had I known my prayers won't reach you. I want to unholy myself if to be unholy is to love you. you. And the last piece for today is called So Perhaps, actually the opening um, prose for this book. And I guess it summarizes everything why I write. I write about myself so you can fathom a personification of sadness. About God, because when you asked me if I am a believer, I told you faith is what I try my hardest to keep dearest. About fear so that I can gradually gain perspective between the night sky and stars. About love because that concept seems out of reach, I'm not built with the capacity for much. About a petal falling because tears are pretty much similar about romance because hope sometimes settles into the dark, about nature because forces are both abstract and concrete, it blows the temple in my heart, about loneliness so I can hear you say I'm not the only one feeling that way. I write about feelings so I can cope with the fear that they might one day not be able to come again, about hell because there are odds and possibilities, about us because there are odds and possibilities, a bit lesser about heaven because the days are too warm here, I hope it rains tonight. I write about death, so when it comes, it tastes like rain at night in heaven. And I write about you, so perhaps you won't forget to remember me. Thank you so much. Intense, Intense. very. And I also would like to unholy myself so I can find love. Is that what you said? Wow, I, I was just really unable to do anything but listen to you, but thank you, Noor, for that. And the last poet today who will be reading is Ao Yong Wai Kit. And you may also see him not only as a reader and a poet today, he's also been walking around, organizing things in a suit. Quite glamorous, I should say. Let us welcome this educator and writer. Wow. And he has edited four poetry anthologies. His writings have been featured in QLRS, poetry.sg, and I like what it says, elsewhere. I'm not really sure what it means elsewhere, but it means probably everywhere. He holds a master's degree in English from the University College in London, has served as a judge of the National Poetry Competition, formerly the president of the National University of Singapore Buddhist Society. He serves as an interfaith harmony advocate. And on the management committee, he's also a member at the Po Ming Tzu Buddhist Temple. Let us now welcome our one of our most active persons here on the floor, wearing a suit, in fact, Ao Young Wai Kit. Thank you, Pamela. Now I'll be sharing three poems, um, and just to be reminded, yes. So of these three poems, uh, the first and third will be based on my Buddhist practice. 
and the second based on the Catholic tradition, and it's featured in A Given Grace. Right? So I was thinking about the, the spirit of seeking clarity in a way which is also common across all faith traditions. And I was thinking about how the practice of mindfulness in particular right, can be so powerful in promoting emotional well-being. And one of my most treasured experiences is, uh, well, meditating you know, in a, a local park. Um, and for me, the silence of the woods is also a kind of, of music in that sense. So this, is, this first poem is Meditation at UT Park, and that's uh, published in the Nature Poetry Anthology from Walden to Woodlands. Here's Meditation at UT Park. Watch closely. The world is always sharper, subtler, and more elusive than recollected. When you shut your eyes, you distill the morning's faint light into the radiant current of now. Exhale and hear. The soft purr of the breath resonates with the hesitant whispers of swaying ferns, interrupting the rain of subliminal silence. The overhanging canopy breathes in tandem with the rustling wind. Unclamp the mind. You harness the power of stray thoughts scattered like the snipped twigs that carpet the earth. The density of your mental foliage empties into the stillness of the sky. At last, against the iridescent glow of daybreak's reflection upon dew-soaked leaves, a largesse of calm fills the fabric of the woods. Arise from your quiet triumph of solitude and rest in invisible, indivisible emptiness. Thank you. So this next poem uh, was for A Given Grace, and it was inspired by the painting Lupa Saming Alta, which is land in our altar, and was by the Filipino artist uh, Imelda Kajipe and Daya. And it's currently displayed also at the National Gallery Singapore. This artwork depicts uh, several figures and female figures in a Filipino rural landscape and it incorporates materials like bamboo and lace and uh, fabric and these are commonly found in rural settings. Uh, and like the artwork, this poem uh, honours rural Filipino women by depicting their strength and their faith through natural disasters, political injustice, um, militarization, and violence right? from then in the 1970s and in a way even until today. So here's Stigmata, a triptych after Lupas Aming Alta by Imelda Kajipe and Daya. In the beginning were hands, lean, coarse, sinewy, fissured hands outstretched to offer blessings of hope to the land, watered by prayers for gentle harvests, issuing from mud and stone. Palms with calluses that recall the discipline of a saviour whose might outstrips even the power, stirring the shoots to cling on despite the drought. Arms raised in benediction before reaching for the earth consecrating it with rich seed, while wielding sickles poised to hallow the unyielding ground. Bent over in fervent genuflection, these able farm hands etch humble devotions upon the landscape, but they bleed too. And it comes to pass, the old paddy fields resume abstinence and fasting, Nature's endurance still extends, curving like gnarled limbs, grasping onto knotted stumps, mangled like the hands of the army that renders unto Caesar that which its gods, that, that comes every season but never hears the rasping hymns the mother sings every day while weaving bamboo mats and gossamer doilies by hand nor can they notice the faint glint from the diaphanous wisp of hair on her daughter's brow. 
her eyes soothed by soft horizons, whispered beneath the halo of a fragmented sun, crimson like pierced hands. Three, for salvation is by grace through faith, not by works, to be tested with Job's afflictions as the storm approaches, answered prayers spilling over as troops of rain mount fresh attacks on sodden soil, rattling the tawny huts with thrusting downpours, hastening to form cascading rivulets, mingling with blood and tears. This tempest sows doubt in the fields, yet it cannot drown the rubble of young shoots. Peering out of the darkness, the mother waits, undaunted, she watches like a guerrilla warrior. Hers is a subtle strength, aching to grow like bamboo, ready to bestow with cupped hands the sanctuary of a rough-hewn heaven. Thank you. And now for my final poem. Here's something more lighthearted. Uh, and this is an imaginative reconstruction of what it would be like if I brought the Buddha, like the historical Buddha, to, of all places, Vivo City. So this is uh, Singapore's largest shopping mall, in case you're wondering. Yeah. He is walking with the Buddha at Vivo City. He strolls along the atrium while I lead the way. Clearly, he enjoys walking. Not so much because of the space or the strong gusts of air conditioning. He just revels in his gentle, joyful steps, his robes soothing the ground as he ambles. A few shoppers turn and stare at him, but then they go on on their way. Moving up the escalator, I beckon him to follow me, but he stands still, watching the ascending stairway in amazement before he steps delicately onto it. We turn into Toys R Us, his eyes scanning the stacks upon stacks of Transformers, action figures, and Barbie dolls. After some thought, I decide to get a chess set for my teenage cousin. And I explain, she likes the king and queen pieces the best. He peers at it. Sure, he smiles. But after the game, the king and the pawn go back into the same box. Enough with toys. I bring the Buddha to Giant, the hypermart. We wander up and down the aisles as he surveys the 20 kinds of bread and the 30 types of jam. At the meat counter, the hair on his bare shoulder stands on end when he sees the packets of flesh wrapped in clear film. At one point, I lose sight of him. Searching frantically from aisle to aisle in this labyrinth of plenty, I scamper around in a panic until I catch a gleam of saffron. He is inspecting a tacky hamper filled with abalone and champagne, crowned by a can of Buddha jumps over the wall. I mutter sheepishly, I hope you're not offended. He beams, oh no, no worry. There are too many walls in this world. It is good to jump over them. Our final stop is Best Denki, where we survey HD TV sets, radios, blenders, and reading lights. In the end, I choose none of it. So we make our exit to wait for our grab car to arrive. And I think aloud, should I have bought that 3M polarizing light reading lamp? It was on offer. He gazes kindly at me and he remarks, be a lamp unto yourself. Thank you. I'm not really sure how it works, like uh, walking with Buddha, but I, I'm very impressed. And I'm sure all of us are, aren't we? I mean, it's just a great collection. And I'm so happy and honored to be here. And I would like to, I'm looking at Eric directly. He's a personal friend. Thank you, Eric. But we want to say thank you on the camera as well as to those who are here. Thank you to our readers and audience. We would like to extend our gratitude to our supporters, the National Arts Council, the estate of Yang Pui Ngon, sponsor books Kinokonia, our partner Poetry Global Network. Without sponsors or supporters, this event is still possible, but not as interesting perhaps. Let's give all our sponsors a big round of applause, even if maybe they're not around today. You are all invited to check out other programs at the Poetry Festival Singapore 22 on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Pamela Wildheart, your host for today, and myself a poet, songwriter, and a recording artist. You have a poetic evening, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy, and I will remember all the memories of today's event. Sincerely, I would like to thank my friend, Dr. Eric Dinsey Valius, for always making sure I'm included in any poetic activities. Thank you. Let's give everybody a big round of applause. And thank you to the team. And thank you to everybody in the field, or on the floor, rather. Thank you. Bye-bye.